Hi there guys and welcome back. Before we move forward in our study of neurophysiology, let's take one more look at the neurons so that we can better understand these cells. We know that the neuron has an elaborate cytoskeleton and that this is a key element in the function of these neurons. Think of the cytoskeleton as the highway system that transits all of the necessary cellular components all throughout the cell. Now axons can get up to four feet long and this takes an incredibly efficient transport system to be able to get the cellular parts to where they're needed. The neuron also has a large number of mitochondria and that's to keep up with its high metabolic demands and an elaborate rough endoplasmic reticulum to provide the enormous demand of proteins needed. These sketches of the soma of neurons are showing the neurofibrils of the cytoskeleton and the nissel bodies of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Please keep in mind that the axon is part of the neuron and it contains organelles as well. We will finish up our discussion of action potentials by looking at the differences between unmyelinated axons and myelinated axons. We know that myelin functions as an insulator. In the peripheral nervous system, the glial cells, called the Schwann cells, coil themselves around axons over and over again, pushing their cytoplasm to the periphery and forming a fatty myelin sheath. This process is so critical that if there is a breakdown in myelin, then there are severe consequences. Let's turn to Molly now and watch an animation about conduction velocities in unmyelinated fibers versus myelinated fibers, and then we'll talk about this a little further in class. Action potentials propagate in a continuous fashion in unmyelinated axons. Once an action potential is generated in the initial segment of the axon, it propagates the entire length of the axon. Recall that a threshold stimulus causes voltage-gated sodium channels to open. The influx of sodium ions generates an action potential. It also establishes a depolarizing current that flows to the next segment and brings it to threshold. Voltage-gated sodium channels open, regenerating the action potential in this segment of the axon. Current flows from this segment and depolarizes the next segment to threshold, thus regenerating the action potential yet again. In this way, regeneration continues in one direction all the way down to the axon terminals. The basis for unidirectional propagation is revealed when we take a closer look. By the end of the depolarization phase of the action potential, all voltage-gated sodium channels inactivate and voltage-gated potassium channels open. These two events render this segment of the axon temporarily insensitive or refractory to another depolarizing stimulus. However, voltage-gated sodium channels in the downstream segment are closed and receptive to a depolarizing stimulus. Thus, propagation occurs sequentially down the axon to the axon terminals. In myelinated axons, action potential propagation is a bit different. Here they propagate in a saltatory or leaping fashion. The myelin sheath consists of multiple layers of tightly wrapped glial cell membrane. But this sheath is not a continuous one. Exposed areas of axonal membrane, known as nodes of Ranvier, occur at discrete intervals. Voltage-gated sodium channels are abundant in the nodes, but largely absent between nodes. So, action potentials are regenerated at each node, not in areas covered by the myelin sheath. However, the myelin sheath does provide the insulation necessary for the rapid spread of depolarizing current. And the sooner the nodes reach threshold, the faster action potentials propagate along the axon. Saltatory conduction is extremely fast. Velocities often exceed 100 meters per second. In contrast, continuous conduction is fairly slow. Velocities rarely exceed 2 meters per second. Nevertheless, 
Both continuous and saltatory conduction propagate action potentials over varying distances because action potentials regenerate along the way. Summary Propagation of an action potential Once generated, the action potential propagates the entire length of the axon without decrement. Thank you again, Molly. That was very informative. So let's now move on to the synapse. Synapses allow information to transfer from one neuron to the next and from a neuron to an effector cell. Synapses can come in many different varieties. Axons typically will end in knob-like axon terminals and these terminals are part of a presynaptic neuron whereas the cell on the other end of the synapse is called a postsynaptic cell. This picture gives us three possible ways that one neuron synapses with another. We have also seen synapses at the neuromuscular junction. We will be focusing our attention on the chemical synapse. And the chemical synapses are accomplished through the release of neurotransmitters. Chemical synapses convert electrical signals to chemical signals. And those chemical signals travel across the cleft, which is then converted back to an electrical signal on the postsynaptic cell's membrane. We will look at the general events associated with the synapse and then we will look specifically at the events at the neuromuscular junction. We begin the process with an action potential traveling down the axon of the presynaptic neuron. Action potential will arrive at the axon terminal, causing voltage-gated calcium channels to open and calcium enters the axon terminal. The calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release neurotransmitters by exocytosis. And the neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to specific receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And the binding of the neurotransmitter opens chemically gated ion channels, resulting in a change in the membrane potential. And the final step is the reuptake of the neurotransmitter to be degraded or diffused away, ending the signal. Now, depending on the postsynaptic target cell, we could see changes in local membrane potentials, or we could see a cascade of chemical reactions that occur within the cell that could cause a myriad of possible effects. Now let's back up a little bit and show the events that occur at the neuromuscular junction during an action potential of a motor neuron. And to do that, I'll call Molly back one more time. Okay, take it away, Molly. Nerve impulses, also known as action potentials, travel from the brain or spinal cord to trigger the contraction of skeletal muscles. An action potential propagates down a motor neuron to a skeletal muscle fiber. The site where a motor neuron excites a skeletal muscle fiber is called the neuromuscular junction. This junction is a chemical synapse consisting of the points of contact between the axon terminals of a motor neuron and the motor end plate of a skeletal muscle fiber. The events at the neuromuscular junction occur in seven coordinated steps. Step 1. An action potential travels the length of the axon of a motor neuron to an axon terminal. Step 2. Voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium ions diffuse into the terminal. Step 3. Calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine via exocytosis. Step 4. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to acetylcholine receptors which contain ligand-gated cation channels. Step 5. These ligand-gated cation channels open. Step 6. 
Sodium ions, shown here in red, enter the muscle fiber, and potassium ions, shown here in blue, exit the muscle fiber. The greater inward flux of sodium ions relative to the outward flux of potassium ions causes the membrane potential to become less negative. Step 7. Once the membrane potential reaches a threshold value, an action potential propagates along the sarcolemma. Neural transmission to a muscle fiber ceases when acetylcholine is removed from the synaptic cleft. This removal occurs in two ways. 1. Acetylcholine diffuses away from the synapse. 2. Acetylcholine is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase to acetic acid and choline. Choline is then transported into the axon terminal for the resynthesis of acetylcholine. Thank you, Molly, once again for a great synopsis. So there are a number of important neurotransmitters that neurons use as the chemical messengers, and we will talk about a few of those in class. So that's it for this video, and I'll see you in class.